Maybe we're doing something right. Not that we want them to run, <laughs> but that's uh, good that they want to. Come on! <laughs> Take your Bibles and turn if you go to the book of Acts. Um, we have, we're going through this series on um, forgiveness. We have talked about the, the challenge of forgiveness, the, um, you know, the reality of forgiveness, the process of forgiveness. This morning we're going to talk about the beauty of forgiveness. And uh, as you might imagine, if you take a word like beauty, Pastor Brian's got to turn it violent. And, um, you know, it's, this, this might be a little rough. It, this is, is, is a challenging sort of thing. And so I just want to kind of give you one of those gut check things. You know, we, we sing not just for the sake of it, but we sing trying to prepare our hearts to come face to face with the truth that we're presented with. And so, again, I want to challenge you. Are you prepared to digest this sermon? Are you prepared to uh, l take these questions that we're going to ask and say, all right, am I on the right side of these? Do I have this squared away? And if not, what am I going to do different? outside of here? What am I going to do different from now on? So, uh, let's start with a question. What does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? Does it, is it just something that you, <clears throat> like a box you check on an application? Yeah? Is it just something that you, you put on a, on a resume or some sort of profile? Is, is being a Christian as, as simple and as shallow as... Um, I, I got baptized when I was a kid, or uh, I, I said a prayer once when I was at camp, or my parents dragged me to church, so I guess I'm a Christian. Is that what it is? And, and I want to pause and make sure that we get this, that, that we really answer this question properly, because I think too many people, especially we, us as Americans, we, we just want to classify everything and everyone, and so we don't want to deal with the realities of where we really are. We just want to say, oh yeah, I'm this, or oh yeah, I'm that. Of all of the labels, of all of the issues associated with who you are and your identity, this is one you need to make sure you get squared away. In Acts chapter number 11, so Acts chapter 11, I want you to see just one simple little verse and again, this is just by this is just introduction stuff, but I, I want you to see this. Acts chapter eleven, verse twenty-six. Uh, we see the basically the first time people were called Christians. Acts chapter eleven, verse twenty-six. It says this. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it, it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first. At Antioch. So Antioch was a city, and it was these disciples, the disciples of Christ, people who were following Jesus. Uh, they, they knew what the church was, and they were, they were assembling. A church literally means assembly, right? So to say that the church, it, it was just a group of, of followers of Jesus, churching together, <laughs> all right, assembling together. And in this town, Antioch, they started calling these people Christians. Well, what does that mean? Were, were they signing the right box or checking the right box on their tax code? <laughs> no. Christian means Christ-like. Christianity is the lifestyle that results from being changed by the gospel, changed by the cross. That's what Christianity is. It's not this building. It's not some religion that, that started in Rome. That is certainly not the case. It, it, it's not a denomination. Christianity is a lifestyle that results from being changed by who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Boom. So Christian, the word Christian, literally means Christ-like. It means that we think the way Christ thinks. We feel the way Christ feels. We behave the way Christ behaves. We value what He values. We love what He loves and we hate what He hated. 
That's what Christian means. Now, obviously, none of us do that perfectly, do we? But to be the Christian life is the process of trying to continually and progressively strive to think the way Christ thought, live the way He lives. Right? Now, you might be thinking, all right, what does all this have to do with forgiveness? Take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 15. You're in Acts, flip forward a little bit to the book of Luke chapter 15. Now, settle in a little bit. Take a sip of coffee because we're going to read more scripture than we normally do on a Sunday morning. You're okay with that, right? Yeah. Luke chapter 15, let's just read. So, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear. The Pharisees and scribes murmured, that means they were complaining and griping and backbiting against him, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. He spake a parable unto them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not receive the ninety and nine, and, and doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends, and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which have no need of repentance. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one, one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she called her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which was I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. He divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder brother's son, the elder son, was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh into the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked, what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Yeah, right. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living, and harlots with, ha with harlots, thou hast killed for him the cat at fat calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet, it means appropriate, that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You know, you know, I like to just shake things up and shock things. You know, 
the beauty of forgiveness is one of Christ's greatest joys. Seeing someone repent, that relationship be restored and forgiveness has taken place, is one of the, the highest values of Christ. Nothing makes him happier. Nothing makes him rejoice like seeing someone get saved. Amen? Amen. The Luke 19.10 says simply this, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus left heaven. He left all the comforts. He left the, the, everything that he was doing, anything that might have brought him joy. And he came to earth. Why? Seeking to save that which is lost. He came to live a life to show us the way we ought to live. But he died on a cross to give you and I the option, to give you and I the way that we can repent and be saved, Amen. be forgiven of our sins. Amen. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a second. Jesus knows your sin better than anyone. Amen? Right. Amen. You ever had someone try and make you feel guilty? Someone really coming at you and acting as if they've just got your number and, and you know, in your relationship, they, you know, you just need to grovel before them because uh, you're not perfect and they're just going to let you know it. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't do that? And he doesn't, does he? He knows your sin better than you do and better than anyone else does, and yet he forgives. Jesus knows their sin better than you do. He suffered more for their sin than you have. You don't understand what she said to me. You don't understand what he did. You don't understand how bad this hurts. You don't know. You don't understand how badly they've hurt me. No, I don't. But uh, you think their sin has cost you more than it cost him? You better let that just sink right down in there. We tend to think way too highly of ourselves and leave Christ out of the picture. And we're so hurt and we're so angry and we're so selfish. Oh, you just don't even talk to me. I've been hurt. Okay. Guess what? I'm going to clue you in about life. You're a sinner, and everyone around you is a sinner. That means you're going to hurt them, and they're going to hurt you. That is just the way it is. You better get used to it. Oh, you don't understand what they did. Really, you, you think that's the, the worst thing that's ever happened to a human being? That you're the first kid that has ever been scolded by their parent? That you're the first parent who's ever had a kid disappoint them. That you're the first person that's ever been robbed or, or had someone flip you the bird. Come on. And yet we let things just destroy our day. We let things just dominate our life. And we forget that the one who knows more intimately than you do and the one who paid far more dearly than you have stands ready to forgive, does he not? Hello. Rescuing lost sheep, returning and restoring of prodigal sons is the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. And if you're going to call yourself a Christian, guess what? Brace yourself. That needs to be the heartbeat of Christians. I don't even know his name. I ha Y'all should be proud of me, okay? I had another image up there that meant more to me, but uh, I thought, well, I don't want to be offensive, you know. So I put some other generic athlete up there winning. You, know, you see someone win an event, and look at, look, at, look at his face, right? You think he's excited? You think he puts some work and effort into winning whatever it is he just won? You see fighters win a fight, and they're like, ah! You see people go across the, uh, they, they ran around... Uh, 
you know, they, they, they ran faster around the, the arena than someone else did. Someone wins the lottery. Ooh, right? You know what I mean? You get a little extra money. You, you might, and, and people act as if, you know, they, they're in rapture. Someone gets saved. We'll see what happens. Someone gets baptized. Ooh. You are not going to put in the effort that it takes to get this done unless salvation moves you the way it moves Christ. I'm saying it straight. The greater the battle, the greater the victory. The more you pour into something, the more you get out of it. And so when you have poured your heart and soul into that lost sheep, poured your heart and soul into that prodigal son, when God rescues that person, and they come to their senses, and they repent, and you have the opportunity to forgive them, that ought to be you. Next week is going to be, that ought to be us. Are you there? You know, the beauty of forgiveness, this right here. Look at that father. Is that how you would be? Boy, just spin up everything you've ever earned in order to pass down to him. Really? Is that how you'd be? Yeah, the Bible talks about the fact that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible tells us very plainly that he that says he loves God but doesn't love his brother is a liar. So when we have this mentality that, oh yes, I love Jesus, but so, sister so-and-so wore the same dress as me and so I am never sitting by her again. Or, Brother so-and-so said something mean to my kid ten years ago, and so I will never set foot in that church again. You are not Christian. And stop lying. St you know, I had someone say yesterday, oh, I'm a member of that church. I was nice, and I didn't say, no, you're not. <laughs> We've updated the role, my friend, and you weren't on it. I was nice. I'm not inviting them to church. Try to love them back. Why? Because the objective isn't about, well, where you been? That's not what it was. It was, you know what? You ought to come see. what If, if you remember, you ought to come see what's going on. Because good things are happening, amen? This is taking place. And so there are three main characters in our story here. There's the, there's the father, there's the prodigal son, and then there's the older brother. And... I, I want to break these down, and I want you to ask yourself which of these people you are more like. Ready? And I had to do this already, and it's no fun, so brace yourself, right? First, there is the father. Now, who or what do you suppose was at the top of the father's list? His business or his boys? You know, 3 John 1, 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. No greater joy. You know, to a real father, his business are his boys. To a Christian man, do you realize that this whole planet, this whole universe... The world tells you that you're just a speck of dust in this ever-expanding universe. You're nothing. You mean nothing. You're going to live. You're going to die. And that's it. The Bible says that all this was created for you. God created the world because He loves you. The mountains, the grass, the trees, the woods. All of it. Every sunrise is God saying, hi. Every sunset is God saying, hey, time to go to bed. God loves you. Created this whole world for us to it, it, it discover and enjoy. And it's all, 
all of it, every single bit of it, is about giving you a point A to point B to learn who he is, accept him, be saved, be forgiven, lay up treasure in heaven serving him. By the way, is it, are you laying up treasure for Jesus in heaven? Boy, get out there and earn me some money. Is that how it is? No. Laying up treasure for whom? For you. This whole thing is for you. It's all about you. God loving you. And your job is to say, God, no, this is about you. I'm here for you. I exist because of you. Everything I do is to bring honor and glory to you. Friends, this church, elite for Christians, it is not about this building. This building could burn to the ground and it, we're still here. It's not about um, traditions and, and, and programs and all of this sort of stuff. It's not about me. This is about you. It's about people. And any time that we or that you or I are willing to damage our relationship with a precious child of God over a pew or a piece of carpet or a fan or a guitar or I'm not getting my way, someone might spill coffee on our precious ca carpet, you're missing the boat. All of this is about Christians. And especially those of us who like to be, like to think of ourselves in this position. We have a grave, grave responsibility. See all these young people sitting around? How are young people doing in the world today? Great? Not so great. Why? Because they're not growing up in Christian homes. They're not growing up in good churches that do their job. We have a job to do. Our business is being and building Christians. Amen? Amen. Not about keeping the show running. The show is the production, the building of people who are like Christ. So, I'm thankful for those who get that. I'm thankful for those who, despite all of our shortcomings and our natural inclinations... I'm thankful for those of us who have our eye on the ball and are driving toward that. But then there's this guy, right? The prodigal son. You think this prodigal son had the mind of his father? You think he thought the way his father thought, felt the way his father felt, valued what his father valued, loved what his father loved, hated what his father hated? Did this boy have anything near... The mind of his father? No, he was chasing his lusts. First Timothy 6 talks about those who would be rich fall into a snare and temptation. It talks about they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. How important do you think repentance and righteousness and faithfulness and forgiveness was to this boy while he was spending his father's money? Huh? Not very important at all. The hard part is this. Can you think of anybody who fits into this category? Can you think of anybody who fits in this category? They don't have the mind of Christ. Being and building Christians is not a priority to them. They've got goals. They, they, they want to have fun. They, they, hey, you don't understand. I've, I've got goals. I've got to build this business. I've got to build this career. I've got to build my, um, up my YouTube views. I've got, I've got to get enough likes on Facebook. I've got, I've got to make my boss happy. I've got to get this education. I've got to get this job so I can get this money, so I can get this house, so I can get this car, so I can get this boat, so I can make enough money where I can earn enough interest so that I can quit working and kick it neutral the rest of my life. Listen, I'm, making money is great. You need to. Retiring is good. You should. Jesus did when he was 30. Okay? All of 
that is good, but what is it about? Why are you doing it? If you're shining and, and wiping the smear marks off of the paint of your car, why? By the way, it's almost a lost cause with Sally, right? People were laughing at me yesterday. Did you all see me out there? I hear Isaac and I wiping down Sally with her paint job such as it is. I didn't laugh at you. <laughs> see, Renee? I got you. But you know, people, other people got it. There were people who would come up, and it was funny to see people who... Sally, my car, was at the car show yesterday for the wrestling team. Some people got it and some people didn't. Some people look at that car and go, yeah, a lot of those got thrown away for good reason. <laughs> and then other people would see Isaac working on it and they'd nod their head. they nod their head. Because that car isn't about me going fast. It don't go fast. All right? It's not about me saying, look at my awesome car. She just needs everything. <laughs> It's about deciding that I just love you. Just as you are, I love you. And you're going to get better. And you're going to keep getting better, period. But I just love you. I love this church. I love my wife. I love my kids. And they're going to get better, every one of us, constantly. You think I'm ever going to be down with Sally? It's not about some sort of end result, look at how perfect and awesome, and I have achieved. No, it's about the process. And it's about who I become by owning her. It's about who he becomes, who we become. You know, to what extent do your thoughts, feelings, and values and priorities fit into this category? You ever find yourself frustrated, discouraged, disappointed, unfulfilled? Because you're not chasing the Father's goals, you're chasing your own goals. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, I can't point to you because I don't know. I'm asking you a hard question. This was not easy for me to ask myself. And when you think about <clears throat> the church, I mean, the average American, they seeking the goals of the Father or are they seeking this? Right? The average church member in America. You know, is this really, do you think you're going to live your life like this and then stand before God when your life is over and God say, oh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You please get this, and I'm off my notes, I've got to be careful here. We read this story of the prodigal son we see this image of the, of the father running with open arms to the boy, and we think, God doesn't care what I do. I can do whatever I want, however I want, and everything's going to be just fine. Uh, you haven't been paying attention to the series. Repentance is conditional. Well, forgiveness is conditional. This boy didn't come, you know, strolling up the lane with his buddies, thinking, Dad, I'm out of money, it's time for some more. That was not taking place. This boy was crawling home with his tail between his legs, and the father was able to perceive before he even was close enough to talk to him, he saw that that change had been made. You and I need to understand that. If we think we're going to bring our, well, I make good money, this church should be happy to have me, See ya. You're not going to make it through membership class. Well, I, you know, I went to this school and I've had this and I, you know, I used to be a deacon, you know. You know, they, they need some deacons over that church. That's not how we play here. But when you get to the point where you desperately want to please God above all else, and you need to be in a community of people that desperately want the same thing, we're going to get along great. I'm going to need you and you're going to need me. Right? So, for those of us who would be saying, well, I'm nothing like this boy. I work hard. I follow the rules. I faithfully attend church. Well, so did the older brother. 
one of my favorite authors, Kent Hughes, he said, it's possible for us elder brothers to leave the father without leaving the farm. You know, this boy was consistent, but he wasn't faithful. He didn't have, the, the older brother didn't have the mind of the father either. The father was watching for this boy every day. The brother, nah. He's crossed the line. He has crossed the line. I have no time for him. You know, the father's business was his boys. And this elder brother, just working for shallow, selfish reasons. I'm the favorite. I'm the one who keeps the ball rolling. I'm the one that is faithful and I attend church. And yes, everyone's going to know how awesome I am. <clears throat> you at your very best as a Christian are shining a light for what reason? For your glory? So that people will say, oh, that summer, she looks, she just shining bright. How amazing a person is she? No. It's, hey folks, over there in the dark where I used to be, come over here, it's better. Look at what God can do. Look at how good he is. That's what it's about. This brother, idiot, donkey, right? Dumb. You know, again, the question is, can you think of anybody who uh, fits into this category? <laughs> anybody who confuses religious activity for a relationship with God? This isn't you, is it? This isn't you. Well, I'm here every Sunday, every Wednesday, and that person over there, they have the gall to speak up in a business meeting and pre present a, an opinion. Hang on a second. Well, Pastor Brian, I just think you're giving too much time and you, you're caring too much about what that person thinks. And, and are they really going to be here next year? I don't know. I'm just listening to their opinion. It's either good or it's not. Either biblical or it's not. Either moves the ball down the field or it doesn't. We better be careful. Because those of us who think ourselves to be the faithful older brother, you better watch it or you'll end up leaving the father without ever leaving the farm. And that means you're not Christ-like. It means you're missing the point. True forgiveness is hard grueling work. And if you've ever done it right, you know. If you've ever looked at someone who broke your heart, infuriated you, crushed you, wronged you, and you look at that person and you say, I forgive you. And you commit to that. I'm not going to bring it up to you again. I'm not going to keep holding it over your head. I'm not going to keep talking about it with everybody else. I'm not going to dwell on it in my own heart. I'm committing to you to leave that offense in the past. Pronounce you innocent, done and over with, forgiven. That's hard. And that is only for those who have the mind of Christ. Though that is only for those who have the mind of the Father. That is only for those who are engaged in the sort of relationship that results in us valuing what He values, loving what He loves, hating what He hates, rejoicing in what He rejoices over. This kind of relationship that results in an overwhelming, life-changing, priority-determining appreciation for the beauty of forgiveness. Do you have the kind of appreciation for the beauty of forgiveness that God does? Because He was willing to go through a whole lot. He was willing to go through hell to appreciate and experience the beauty of forgiveness. Are you? 
you know, when you have that appreciation, it results in a passion. It results in a persistence. And it results in the power to be able to overcome your ignorance, to overcome your anger, to overcome that hurt, to overcome that fear, to overcome that fatigue, to overcome that laziness, and to go fight and win your brother back, your sister back, your spouse or your kid back. You fight like a scalded dog. You claw, you scratch, you wait, you're patient. And there is nothing that's going to stop you as long as it takes, no matter what it takes, you are hunting, you are fighting to see restoration, repentance, forgiveness take place. And it's real forgiveness. Not some sort of shallow tolerance. Well, I guess you've started coming to church again, so i got to put up with you. i got to be nice, or pastor will get me. You just stay over there. Don't put us on the same team together. You just know that me and so and so just don't get along. Oh, yeah, that's why you're on the same team. I would never do that, would I? Listen, that right there. Come on now, go. Ryan, change me. Back. That's it, folks. That's the sermon today. You see that? That is hard. That's hard. But if you can look at that picture and there's something inside of you, Christ inside of you resonating, saying, that's it. That's what you're going for. That's what it's all about. Push. Work hard. Crush your anger. Crush your fear. Crush your hurt. Get over it. Go get that. Then you have the mind of Christ. Anything else? Fool yourself. Billy, pray while I go get ready for baptism.